Andrea Arnold's American Honey is a film that defies convention. It was shot in a mere 56 days with a cast of mostly untrained actors, and despite being a critical success, was a financial failure. But the largest break in convention comes from its mute narrative, despite it being a film that has a lot to say about America, youth, women, and the growing wage gap. Arnold first got wind of the Meg Crew lifestyle from a New York Times article in 2007. It was an article I saw that somebody uh, gave me that thought they thought I might be interested in this world. It was a long time ago, an article in the New York Times. Ian Urbina details the cutthroat world of door-to-door -door magazine subscription selling and revealed that the crews are comprised of poor teenagers. Sold on the premise of getting to see America party at night and make money during the day, it at least appears to be an attractive gig. The reality of the job, however, ranked it one of the worst jobs in America for teenagers by the National Consumers League in 2009. The lowest seller of the day is often beaten or made to fight another low seller. Many May crews steal jewelry and other valuables from the homes of customers, partially because they only make $15 a day for 14 hours of work with the rest of their pay being used for incurred expenses, such as gas and motel costs. Those who don't sell enough magazine subscriptions are abandoned on the side of the road. Cost me when you don't earn. Do you get that? This shit, the motel, the gas, everything, that costs me. And I can't run my business like that. So you show me you can do it or I'll leave you on the side of the road. Clear? All of these real anecdotes from the 2007 article made their way into American Honey. After doing several road trips across America herself, Arnold wrote the screenplay in 2013. She didn't cast trained actors, but instead combed beaches, parking lots, and state fairs for teenagers who looked the part. She started in Panama City because a lot of teenagers go down there looking for work. It's hot, and they can sleep on the beach when they get there. After meeting with Shia LaBeouf, Arnold decided that he would be a great fit for this film, as Shia himself is not a stranger to the road trip lifestyle. You told people where you were and asked them to come give you a ride. Yeah. And then you just went with them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, it sounds crazy on paper, but it really, you It know... sounds crazy verbally as well. It sounds... Yeah. LaBeouf also doesn't shy away from more artistic projects. Sasha Lane was found while on spring break with her friends in Florida, who took the lead role and rounded out the cast. The film itself is a coming-of-age story for the young star as she joins a mag crew, but Star's journey is often eclipsed by the foreground the mag crew drives past. The mag crew encounters a diversity of people from all walks of life, and in so doing, shines a hard light on the problems of America. Along the way, Star meets those who are desperately poor like herself, working class truckers, oil workers who have more money than sense. I'll give you $500 to hang out with me. Yeah. The upper middle class, and rich cowboys whose only problem is too much free time. Since 1976, the top 1% of income earners in the United States has more than doubled their share of their total yearly income in the country, from 8.9% in 1976 to 22.5% in 2012. This means that nearly a quarter of the US economy is working to pay 1% of the population every year. Keep in mind also that this is a measure of the rate of growing wealth inequality, not the amount, that is, how much wealth the top 1% already has. As of 2007, the top 1% amounted to 34.5% of America's total, and the top 20% owns 85% of all the wealth in America. That leaves just 15% of all America's wealth in the hands of 80% of the population. The US is the fifth worst country in the world by wealth inequality, despite being the richest country in the world by a large margin. Interestingly, socioeconomic mobility hasn't changed much in the last 40 years, but unfortunately it was low 40 years ago and is still low today. What this means is that the deck is stacked against the poor from the outset. Not only do the rich keep getting richer, but it remains as hard as ever to get above the poverty line if you're already under it. And this is the serendipitous brilliance of American Honey. It shows the incredible wealth inequality in America through the eyes of its desperately poor youth as they make their way across the country. But Arnold uses this road trip movie as an opportunity to show the stark contrasts in lifestyle that exists under one country. Even within the mag crew, there is evidence of inequality. Crystal drives in a separate car, has a separate hotel room, and the reality is that mag crew managers are really the only ones who make any money, according to the New York Times article. There's even some irony in casting Shia LaBeouf, whose net worth as of 2017 is 25 million, alongside a cast of, at the time, vagrant teens Arnold found in state fairs and parking lots. The final representation of this inequality is Jake's revised American dream. I just want to get like most about some more in the woods and just fucking just stay smart.
small, you know, like a little duplex or something. Like the 40 acres in the mule, you know, just a piece of land in the woods somewhere. A bittersweet fantasy that the poorest American could only hope for. A life of simplicity and a place to call home. Not a lot to ask for, but for Jake and Star, it's a dream they'd be lucky to realize. There are many candid shots of animals in American Honey, and at first glance they offer no commentary at all. Yet the amount of screen time and focus Arnold gives to these shots leads one to the conclusion that there must be some significance to these scenes. As a result, the internet is rife with speculation. Some believe that the animals reflect the helplessness of the characters to their circumstances. Star treats animals with respect because they too have little control over this situation. The Meg crew and the animals share the same plight. A similar theme plays out in Arnold's 2009 film Fish Tank, wherein the main character believes that if she can just free this horse, she too can escape her own circumstances. Jack Smith, on the other hand, wrote an article detailing his belief that Arnold shows a dichotomy between animals that are free, such as the bear in this scene, and those that are in chains, such as the cows being taken to slaughter. They each represent society's desire to categorize and make commodities out of living things. The people the Meg crew visits are trapped animals. The Meg crew, meanwhile, is free, not tied down by possessions or money or responsibility, and consequently, they don't fit into society. Indeed, the Meg crew seems much more at home when they're in the wilderness than in suburbia. At times, they also behave much like wild animals. I have my own explanation for these animal shots, and it's a much simpler theory. Animals are beautiful things that can be enjoyed by the rich and the poor alike. There's another animal scene in Fish Tank that gets overlooked, where the main character is taken to a river and taught how to fish. The rest of the film is set against bleak, grey buildings filled with the poor and the unfortunate. But here, in nature, the main character enjoys a moment of happiness that can be enjoyed by anyone, whether they're rich or poor. In fact, it's discovered later in the film that one of these characters is a lot wealthier than the other, yet both enjoy it just the same. The same logic can be applied to American Honey. Because animals and nature are beautiful and cost nothing, the moments that Star has with animals are where she's happiest. The way Star reveres animals is a reflection of her character and what she values. This directly impacts the context of the ending scene. Jake gives Star a turtle, which she releases and promptly enters the water herself. Due to the elusive narrative, there are many interpretations of what this scene signifies for both Jake and Star's relationship, as well as what the future holds. Jesse Gumbarch believes that Jake's offer of a turtle to Star is a peace offering for having left without warning earlier in the film. She lets it go to signify that she's no longer dependent on Jake for happiness. She then enters the water despite not being able to swim and experiences a rebirth. Others believe Jake giving the turtle to Star means that he wants her to let him go. He's never going to change and she deserves better. Jake is in fact setting her free and she accepts that. My personal belief is similar to Jesse's. At its core, this movie is a coming of age story about a young woman experiencing a trying time in her life. Jake gives her the turtle as a gift, trying to make up for his disappearance. Animals, as I previously hypothesized, are nature's bounty freely enjoyed by anyone. This is not Jake setting her free, it's a reassurance of their continuing relationship. Star sets the turtle free just like the other animals and insects she encountered and enters the water. There is a strong parallelism to a baptism suggesting that Star is born again, about to experience a new chapter in her life. The scene signifies that she's gained confidence, maturity, and is not afraid for what the future might bring. However, given that Andrea Arnold is tight-lipped on the subject and this movie is filled with symbolism and little context, she undoubtedly wanted viewers to make their own interpretation. So how did you interpret this movie? Let me know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been the Film Herald.